Today we're going to continue our study of the book of Galatians, and I'm going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. And it says there, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In 1965, in Kenya, there was a man by the name of Daniel Wasabi. And he was so committed that he decided that he was going to be crucified for the sins of Kenya. So he managed to coerce his wife into nailing him to a cross. And immediately, she fell down from shock and she died. But a neighbor later came and took him down and he lived for a while, but he got an infection from the nails and he died as well. Paul is talking about being crucified with Christ. Is, is that what you're speaking of? Uh, absolutely not. God is never pleased when we unnecessarily harm ourselves, and the death of one of us does no good for the world. It was only the death of the pure and perfect Son of God that was able to save us from all of our sins. So it is not to be taken literally, but it is to be taken completely. George Mueller was a great pastor of another age, and he said, there was a day I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, performances, taste, and will, died to the world, its approval or blame, even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have only to show myself approved to God. So every part of us is to be crucified with Christ. And that includes, first of all, our feet. Our feet are to be crucified. And you remember that, uh, that Jesus' feet were actually nailed to the cross, probably a long nail that went through both feet, extremely painful. And yet Jesus suffered all of that. And he also indicates that the feet are important for other reasons. Before Jesus was taken into captivity, the disciples had a meal with him, and then he got a basin of water, and a towel, and he started to wash the feet of his disciples. He got to Peter. <clears throat> Peter didn't want his master to do his feet, and said, he said, not me, Lord. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash my feet, you can, your feet, you can have nothing to do with me. And so Peter said, well, wash everything. And Jesus said, well, if you've had a bath, you don't need the rest of you washed, only the feet, because the feet in that day were dusty with the sandals, and a good host would always go and wash the feet of the people that came as guests. Well, we know too that uh, uh, Jesus was the perfect Son of God and His feet were perfect as well and His feet were crucified for you and for me. Henry Sloan Coffin was a pastor of another age and on one occasion he went to China. While he was there he was talking to some Chinese pastors and he said, you know, what was it that caused you to become a Christian? Was it the miracles of the Bible? And they said, no, we had miracles in our own religions. They said, well, was it the great teachings? And they said, no, we had great teachings in our religions as well. And so he said, well, exactly what was it that caused you to become believers? And one of them spoke up and said, it was the picture of Jesus taking a bowl of water and a towel and washing the feet of his disciples. We had nothing like that. The feet are important, and one activity, one of the primary activities we find in the Bible, uh, Paul speaks about this in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news. Now, I can tell you, in my personal opinion, most feet are not very attractive. Unless you're a baby, none of our feet are beautiful. But Paul is saying here that those that bring the good news of Jesus Christ have beautiful feet because of what they bring. And Jesus gave the same kind of instructions. Uh, he said in Acts 1.8, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And the disciples did that. Peter's primary ministry was to the nation of Israel. And then Paul, the, the uh, apostle to the Gentiles, went on missionary journeys through the, the Gentile world. And if he had not been caught and 
put in prison for preaching the gospel, he probably would have had a lot more uh, missionary journeys than these. They took the gospel everywhere because they had been given the command and they used their feet. Now, how important are the feet? Well, you only have to ask someone that does not have feet how important they are. They are absolutely vital and one of the main tasks of the feet is to take us to present the gospel to the world that does not know Jesus. Hudson Taylor was a great missionary from England and he went to China and he had a great burden for the Chinese people. He actually started wearing the same clothes that they did and he, he shaved his hair, hair because he wanted to look like them and not be a distraction and he learned to be able to preach in many different languages in the Chinese country. But he also had such a great burden for the people. He, he encouraged other people to come as well. And by the time that he died in 1905, over 200 missionaries had gone to China. And over 18,000 Chinese people had become Christians. And that has only grown exponentially over the years. Another great missionary that you've probably heard of is Jim Elliott. He graduated from Wheaton College and he felt that God was calling him to be with the Aka Indians in Ecuador. And he knew that this tribe was not very well known, but they were a violent people. He had almost no contact with the outside world. But he was determined to try to win them to Christ. And they dropped supplies from the plane and then they built an encampment uh, not too far away from the Indians. But then one day they came and they killed Jim Elliot and also his four companions. But that was not the end of the story. Jim Elliot's wife continued to try to minister to them. Eventually, they were able to lead many of the people to Christ, even some of the ones that had put to death her husband and the others. So what about us here in Ahihik? We have a missionary task as well. I know that some of you probably were like me. I actually felt God was calling me to Ahihik. I didn't know exactly why. I didn't anticipate that I would end up pastoring a church. But nevertheless, God called me here, and I saw the great need. And it's difficult for me sometimes to present the gospel to people that are Hispanic, because my Spanish is not good enough. But I did have the opportunity to talk to my now wife and baptize her in my swimming pool. And that was the, one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I am pleased to know that there are some church members that invite others to come to church that are English speaking. We have our Hispanic group that reaches out to the Spanish people. There are those that actually perform a witness each and every day that they come in contact with people that are not believers. Our feet have been crucified and Christ is in our feet. And then our hands have been crucified. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, his hands were stretched out and they put nails in each one of his hands. And you can imagine the blood dripping down from his hands to his elbows and then down to the ground. Likewise, our hands have been crucified with him. And that means that Christ is in us and we are to perform the work that he would be doing if he were here on earth right now. We are his hands. I can play a couple little tunes on the piano. Uh, they're not very good and many times I hit the wrong keys, but nevertheless I can do just a little bit. But let's say that a master pianist were to take over my body, he could produce music that I could not even begin to imagine. And in the same way you and I have been crucified with Christ, our hands are crucified and as a result Christ is moving and acting in us through our hands. We're doing the work of Christ today. In Matthew chapter 25, we find the verse that has actually become the theme of our church. And Jesus is saying at the last days, he will say, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. One of those, he says, is I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was talking this last week to Martine, who directs our mission program. And he said, since the beginning of the year, with the help of donations and others, we have delivered well over 1,000 grocery bags to families that are designed to last them 
uh, most of the month. He said, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, provided for children some 1,920 meals every month. And in most of the cases, we actually give food to the ladies in the villages. They cook it and they serve it to the children many times before they go to school. Then also, we at our church building cook meals on Tuesday and we freeze some of that. But uh, during uh, the month, we actually give out about 320 meals per month. And that includes meals that are given to the Substance Abuse Center where uh, some of our pastors go and they preach and they talk to the men that are there. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, Jesus said, and you gave me drink. Now, we actually try to do something about water as well because in La Zapatera, one of the villages where we work, uh, they had a great number of cases of kidney disease caused by the water. The water was polluted. It had arsenic and other chemicals in it. And there were 12 to 15 children every year that died from this. And so we were going to build a water purification plant there. But as it turned out, maybe the government heard what we were going to do. And they decided to build a well about a mile away from the village and they would pump the water to the village. And that actually worked out real well, but we still wanted to verify that the water was pure. And so we tested it and found indeed that it is pure. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Then <clears throat> I was a stranger and you took me in. I'm pleased that you know, there are times when our church members take in people, even from what I gather, there are people that are taken in that uh, they don't really know, but they're just providing them with a place. And so, what a great thing to take in a stranger. But when you're doing that, Jesus said, you're doing that for me. And then it says, I was naked and you clothed me. And we don't have a clothes closet at our church. We actually have a whole room filled with clothes. And especially since the pandemic began, uh, people need clothes. And it's, this especially is true of the children. And many times we've run out of clothes because... Uh, there, were more, there was more of a demand than we had the supply. And so we actually sent some of our people. They went to the market in Chapala. And they have a lot of clothes there every week. And they're very inexpensive. And so we've bought children's clothes. But if you have children's clothes or even adult clothes that you do not need, uh, donate that to our clothing room. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you ministered to me. I am so grateful that we have the Compassion Care Committee. They call people and they encourage them and they strengthen them. And if somebody's sick, they visit them. My next door neighbor is our nurse. She was a nurse in Canada. And uh, if there's somebody that's sick, she goes there, even at the risk of her own health. And she takes blood pressure for people. She take, does sugar tests for those with diabetes. She gives shots for the flu for those that need that as well. What a great ministry. I was sick, and you ministered to me. And then I was in prison, and you visited me. There were two prisons in Guadalajara, men's prison and a women's prison. And so we have people that go to the prisons, and they give food because sometimes there's not enough food. They give clothes because they don't provide that. And the prisons in Mexico are very different than the ones in the United States, but we're trying to provide a witness, but also we're trying to lend a helping hand to those that have need. We've also had uh, literacy classes, and these were primarily for children that had never been to school. And we have temporarily suspended those because of the virus, but we're going to start them back up again. Then we had a computer class. We had an ESL class. Uh, we had sewing classes. And we have even additional plans for the future. Christ's hands are in us. Our hands have been crucified with Christ. And we are doing his work here on earth. And finally, our hearts are crucified. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the soldier thrust a spear in his side. And out came water and blood. Not water mixed with blood but they were separated. And the scientists say that this can happen when the heart gives out. And when a person was on the cross long enough, the heart would just 
give out because it was not getting a blood supply. And so water and blood came out of the body of our Lord. And you and I likewise uh, have our hearts crucified with Christ. Now the heart is usually considered the, the center for our motives, our desires, our will. And so our hearts are given over to Christ. Can you imagine Jesus' heart breaking? And it broke because he was deserted by his nation. He came first to the nation of Israel and they rejected him. And then his disciples abandoned him when he was captured and ready to be crucified. And finally on the cross, he was forsaken by the Father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was all alone. His heart was broken. But our hearts likewise are crucified in and through him. And what that means is that we surrender our will to the will of God. When you become a believer and your heart is crucified, you become an absolutely new person. You remember, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew what was before him. He was going to suffer and die a horrible death on the cross. And he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cross, take this cup from me. But then he added, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's a prayer that we ought to pray. I, I remember praying that prayer just recently. Found out that Ernesto had lymphoma, cancer of the lymph nodes. And I prayed, Lord, if it's possible, let him get well. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And I know that uh, Ernesto has said, regardless of what happens, he is at peace. He has absolute and total faith in God. And he's not afraid, regardless of what takes place. It's possible for many people to have a head knowledge about God, but their hearts have never been crucified. When I was chaplain at the prison, we got some inmate chaplains that came from Angola, the Bible college there. And one of those was a guy by the name of Buddy. Buddy had committed armed robbery, and so he was sentenced to be in Angola. At that time, Angola was considered the bloodiest prison in America with some 5,000 inmates. And Buddy, who had boxed in the Navy and was a really good fighter, uh, was considered by many to be the most dangerous man at Angola. He told me later, and he really didn't like to talk about this very much, but he said sometimes he would go into the cafeteria to eat and nobody else would sit at the table with him because they were afraid. On one occasion, it flooded because Angola is right next to the Mississippi River. And if there's a lot of water, there's a lot of flooding. And so they had to move some of the inmates. And they went to Buddy not once but twice to move him to another cell. And after that, he said to them, well, you know, I've been really cooperative in moving a couple of times, but don't do this again. And the guard said to him, well, Buddy, there's an inmate that nobody else wants to be with in the cell. And Buddy said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. As long as the, the guy is not completely crazy, you can put him in the cell with me. And the guard said, yes, but you are that inmate. But his life began to change. His father died and other considerations. He began reading the scriptures and then a group of people with a group called Kairos came in. And they come three days and they provide food, but they worship, they love them, share the scriptures with them. And during that time, Buddy became a Christian. He confessed his sins and he asked Christ to come into his life. It was a great transformation. Buddy finished the seminary and he came to our prison. And he was one of the hardest workers I have ever seen for God. Maybe he was thinking that you know, he did so many bad things that maybe he could do some good things, not as a way of saving himself, but just as a compensation. But he was also the most humble man that I had ever seen. He was not afraid of anything. But he was very humble and he worked very hard. Today, Buddy is out of prison. The last time I talked to him, he was driving with another inmate. They were going to a prison for a Kairos event to be able to give back something of what they had received. And he's been in ministry ever since he's been out of prison. 
you know, in these verses, it talks about being crucified with Christ, but the thing that followed the crucifixion was the resurrection. And in one sense, as the old person within us dies, is crucified, there is a resurrection that takes place in this life, a resurrection with a new life in Christ. And then it says in verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Remember here, Paul is talking about the Judaizers that said that in order to become a Christian, you first of all had to become a Jew. You had to obey all the Jewish rules and regulations, including circumcision. And Paul is saying throughout the book of Galatians, that is not right. It is Christ and Christ alone. His grace and the law never could save anybody. I read about a guy and he adopted a collie, a beautiful collie. But the collie was afraid and didn't like to be with him when we first got him. And so they would go out to walk and the collie would run away and he'd have to go try to find him and bring him back again. But then uh, he bought a chain and a collar. And so the collie had to stay with him. But as they would walk every day, day something happened. The collie began to trust him and to love him. So one day they were about to go out and the collie came to have his collar put on. And he said to the collie, not today. And so they went out and the collie ran. But then in just a short time, he came right back because he loved the master. He no longer needed the chain. He was actually free, but it was love that caused him to come back again. That's true of us. The Bible says that we are no longer under the law, the chain that held us and constrained our actions. But instead today, we are controlled by something much greater. We are constrained by the grace of God, the love of Christ.